By 1812, Napoleon's armies controlled most of mainland Europe. A French army larger than the population of Canada was poised on the Russian border, ready to invade. Britain controlled the seas. Led by Speaker Henry Clay and a group of congressmen called the War Hawks, Congress declared war for the first time ever in June. Their enemy, Great Britain, was struggling to defeat Napoleon in Europe. Angry over the British practice of impressment, taking sailors off American ships on the high seas to man British warships, and out of a desire to liberate Canada from its British rulers and add its vast territory to the American Union, Congress had declared a war the country was not prepared to fight. The first two months of conflict brought a stunning series of defeats on the border between the U.S. and Canada. Fort Mackinac, Fort Dearborn, and worst of all, Detroit were all surrendered to the British without a shot being fired. And the reeling Americans had yet to battle the strongest military force in the world, the British Navy. Britain's dominance of the seas stood unchallenged since the Battle of Trafalgar seven years earlier. The British fleet boasted more than 600 vessels, while the entire American Navy consisted of just 16 ships, the largest of those frigates. It was believed that no other nation's evenly matched ship could defeat a British vessel in single combat. USS Constitution was as powerful a weapon as the American Navy possessed. She was, as Oliver Wendell Holmes would later describe her, the meteor of the ocean air. President John Adams had attended her launching. Her hull was thicker than most ships of the time, 21 inches, and it was made from a dense wood available only in America, live oak. The copper sheathing that covered her bottom had been attached by Paul Revere, and George Washington had chosen her name. Officially, a 44-gun frigate Constitution actually carried 54 guns. In addition to the cannon on the gun deck, Captain Isaac Hull had mounted 10 carronades on the spar deck above for extra firepower. A short-barreled cannon, useful only at close range, a carronade could be loaded with grape shot to tear into enemy crews, or with chains or barbell-shaped pieces of iron to tear apart an opposing ship's rigging. Hull put to sea on July 12th, seeking to join the five-ship squadron of Commodore Rogers, which had sailed from New York three weeks earlier. Sighting five ships off New Jersey five days later, Hull thought he had found the American squadron and began to approach as evening fell. But by the next morning, Constitution's lookouts realized it was actually a British squadron which began to give chase. Constitution was no match for a full squadron of enemy ships. To engage them in battle would mean certain doom. But as Captain Hull tried to escape, the wind died. All of the ships were now becalmed. To keep moving, Hull ordered his crew to put boats over the side to tow the ship out of range, using kedge anchors to pull the ship forward and wetting the sails down to take advantage of every breath of wind. The British ships soon did the same thing to stay in pursuit. When one of the British ships pulled too close, Constitution fired her stern cannon at the men rowing the longboat. The enemy ship backed out of cannon range but remained in pursuit. The chase 
with men rowing boats constantly in the July heat, lasted almost three days. In the end, the captain ordered more than 2,000 gallons of Constitution's drinking water dumped overboard to make her lighter. After 57 hours of desperate struggle, the wind finally picked up. With Constitution now two and a half miles away from the nearest pursuer, the British finally gave up the chase. Constitution had narrowly escaped her first wartime encounter with the British. Depleted but undamaged, she headed into Boston to resupply. She did not remain there long. Cannons were the dominant weapons for both armies and navies. In some cases, cannons were transferred from the forts they protected to ships that needed extra firepower. The uh, cannon used during the uh, War of 1812 were made from uh, bronze material. That tends to be a soft material as compared to the uh, later versions used during the Civil War, which were uh, cast iron and also uh, gun steel, machine gun steel cannon. They uh, weren't able to rifle the cannon. Uh, they could do it physically, but it wouldn't hold up because the metal was too soft. Unfortunately, there were times when the cannon would uh, blow up. That was one of the dangers they had. In fact, a lot of the cannon that were uh, cast would have what we would call handles on there, but they were actually looked like dolphins and they were uh, good luck charms to hope that the cannon would never blow up. The cannon uh, built in the uh, War of 1812 or used in the War of 1812 were muzzle-loaded cannon, which means that the uh, gunpowder was first loaded into the cannon uh, and then the cannon shot was loaded in it, all from the muzzle end. They fired it by putting in a, a striker pin in a uh, what they called a touch hole. It was a hole on the uh, breech end of the cannon, although they weren't able to open it up at that time. And uh, they would put this pin in there and then uh, pull it out, strike a spark, and then would uh, ignite and uh, ignite the gunpowder, and then the uh, projectile come flying out. After they fired the cannon, uh, they would then go in with the warmer and clean out any residue that remained in there from the bag of the uh, propellant. Then they would swab it with a wet uh, swab that they would dump into a bucket of water to wet it and then slide it into the uh, cannon tube. Uh, afterwards, when they would load the propellant, they would put the propellant in the muzzle end and then push it in all the way down to the far end. When they pushed it in, they had to hold their hand so that uh, if there happened to be an explosion, the, uh, their thumb had to be facing away from the muzzle end so that in case there was an explosion, that the uh, rod would come flying out and slide through their hand and not uh, rip their hand off if they had their hand in the opposite direction. The actual time to fire a cannon uh, from the cycle would take about uh, three to five minutes. After resupplying in Boston, Constitution returned to patrol. From Boston Harbor we set sail when it was blowing a devil of a gale with a ringtail set all about the mizzen peak and the rubrics and a bowing of the deep with the yo he ho to ro ro in the late afternoon of August 19th, a lone warship was spotted. As Constitution approached, the other ship raised an English ensign. It was Guerrier, one of the ships that had chased Constitution three weeks earlier. Both vessels rigged sail for battle. Giving three cheers, Constitution's crew of 456, including 55 Marines, Essential in an era when boarding parties often proved the decisive factor in a naval battle, prepared for the fight. 
Guerrier fired first, at long range. Two shots struck Constitution's hull and bounced off, causing one of the sailors on board to cheer, Huzzah! Her sides are made of iron! As she approached, Constitution fired a broadside, which shattered Guerrier's rear mast. Falling overboard, the mast now slowed the British ship, making it almost impossible to maneuver. As Constitution pulled ahead, she turned to fire more broadsides across her opponent's bow. Passing in front of Guerriere, Constitution stayed close, trying to inflict as much damage as possible. Before she could get clear, Guerriere's bowsprit snagged in the rigging of Constitution's mizzenmast. The two ships were now tangled. Seeing a chance to finish the battle, the Marine commander, Lieutenant William Bush, leaped on to the taffrail to board the British vessel and was immediately shot dead by an enemy sniper. Two other Marines trying to board were wounded. So was Guerrier's captain, James Dakers, who was shot in the back by a Marine sniper but refused to leave his post. The ship separated as Constitution continued to fire broadsides Soon, both of Guerrier's other masts had fallen. Now a useless hulk, she had no mast on which to even hoist a surrender flag. As darkness loomed, Guerrier fired a single cannon shot in the opposite direction from Constitution. It was the only way her captain had to signal his capitulation. The battle lasted less than an hour. After taking the surrendering enemy crew aboard his own vessel, Captain Hull ordered the shattered wreck of Guerrier burned. It was a stunning result for both sides. To an American nation that had suffered nothing but reports of defeat from the Niagara frontier in the two months since war began, it was an immense morale boost. For the British, who had proved their naval superiority against the best navies in Europe, it was a humiliating defeat. For Constitution, it had earned a place in naval history, and from one sailor's exultant cheer, an unforgettable nickname, Old Ironsides. Oh, 